today we are looking at one of Henri Bergson's most important, most interesting, but also most difficult texts, Matter and Memory. This book came out in 1896 and was Bergson's second major work after Time and Free Will. And it was specifically devoted to the question of the mind-body relation, the relation between the mind and the body as handed down by philosophy and as was being debated by psychologists and physiology philosophers in his time. He wants to charter a path between idealism and materialism, as well as between dualisms and reductionism. He wants to incorporate whatever is true about science and about me me mechanisms working within our sensory systems and our bodies, and on the other hand, of the mind, of the existence of spirit, of the causality which comes not through determinism, but is of the soul, the mind, or spirit. Basically, he wants to make a sort of compatibilist theory that combines both of these perspectives. Rather than simply explain a theory to us or give us a certain set of arguments, Bergson tries to sort of take us on a journey to experience something for ourselves and in this process to upend the paradigms which we are using to understand the psyche and the body and to undergo a kind of transformation that leads to a new form of inquiry. As we will see, it's the relation between the infinite and the finite, or the integral and the derivative, which shapes his entire discussion of memory and the formation of consciousness. He starts us on this journey by having us approach our immediate experience with fresh eyes. He wants us to have a renewed sense of everything that is given to us in our immediate experience. And he starts by redefining, in a way, the idea of image. And he wants to make image or images the fundamental given of our experience. They are the basic and pervasive element within sensation, perception, and consciousness. By image, Bergson doesn't mean something finite or something like a representation or something that is static nor does he intend it to be something purely visual. He's using this term in a very idiosyncratic way and trying to reframe and reinvent its meaning. For Bergson, images are in flux. They are qualitative fluxions. And here I'm again drawing on this term from calculus. The differential or fluxion is a infinitely small amount of change and evolution and becoming. Every image is like that. It has a sort of vector and a sort of change and a certain depth of its evolution. Now, it actually takes some work to get to a point where we experience our sensations with this intensive and fluxuous dimension. Uh, most of our experience is reduced. Our images are impoverished and diminished. We subtract their richness in order to make sense of the world and get a clearer sense of what's going on around us and how it is going to affect our actions and our expectations in the future. The job of consciousness is essentially to diminish and uh, repress and filter the complexity of our experience into something manageable, into something coherent. So the first job of consciousness is to repress and to filter what we are perceiving in its complexity. When we act, we are absorbed in the activity and we are completely interested in achieving our purpose and we do not pay any attention to the complex inner workings of our consciousness within this action, mixing sensations and memories and representations and imaginations and concepts basing our uh, piloting from moment to moment on our prior experience and other memories that we have of similar experiences and putting this all together in order to attain the results now all of that goes on without us monitoring it without us watching it or knowing really how it's happening 
the habits of our mind is such that we repress everything that is not immediately relevant to the task at hand. In order to get around in the world, in order to be practically engaged with things, we can't be daydreaming and just thinking about anything. We need to pay attention to what's going on around us, draw in whatever is relevant to making sense of that situation, and uh, allowing certain images and memories to come in at the exclusion of others. And this is what consciousness does primarily and for the, f for the most part. What we need to do is to break with these habits. These habits of repressing and filtering our experience while they're necessary in practical life, they do not help us in philosophy and psychology. We tend to grab snapshots as static photographs. We tend to think about concepts as solids, or we tend to think about the existence of realities in terms of solids, objects in space. And we tend to think precisely by laying out ideas in space and diagramming them and sketching them. All of these ways of thinking are extremely helpful in our practical life, but it's wrong to use these techniques in our attempt to understand the nature of the soul and the nature of consciousness and the relation of spirit and body, memory and matter. So while we don't normally reflect on these activities in our daily life, philosophy and psychology begin reflecting on these things. When we attempt to understand what's happening in consciousness, we start by projecting concepts we formed in our perception of the external world. And in the kind of patterns and habits that we use within our practical life. We tend to view things like objects that can be manipulated or attenuated to our needs, like a material object. We use the logic of substance and predicate, and we see psychical states as the empty substratum in which atoms of feeling flow and compose themselves. Essentially, we take the view of matter developed in the 17th through the 19th century of atoms in a void, constructing the bodies that we see, but we don't perceive that underlying structure. Likewise, psychologists tend to think of the soul as this kind of void in which psychical atoms come to be con combined and connected, and that's what makes up our experience of ourself. But for Bergson, we need to completely get rid of this spatial image of consciousness and of psychical states. Images do not exist in the void as atoms, but in a plenum as a matrix of interrelated qualitative fluctuations and evolutions. Images are less than things, but more than representations. An image is not, according to Bergson, like a representation for the German idealists, which is not the thing in itself, but is something that arises within us that is the phenomenal dimension of what we are experiencing. In that sense, the representation and the phenomenal is not the thing itself and there's a difference between those. So Bergson's not adopting this view of representation. He's saying that the image is more than a representation. On the other hand, it's less than a thing and a thing is what we consider in the empiricist tradition coming from Hume as some object which causes us to experience something. This would be called by Kant naive empiricism a thing out there is subsisting in itself and is a unity in and of itself. The image is therefore less than a thing. It doesn't have this substance ontology to it. It's a kind of diffusion in a matrix, a plenum. Uh, and it's also more than a representation. One of the ways I think about images here is in terms of movements, because Bergson is really trying to say that an image is a type of movement. And what we see with different forms of movement is that they are not necessarily replicated in the way information and data is propagated. It is not like a quality being transferred from one 
region to another region, but instead a kind of qualitative change can occur as a movement is propagated from one medium to another. So I'm thinking here of like when you pluck a string on an instrument, at first you have the movement, which is the pluck, which is a sort of linear movement of the pick or of your finger striking the string. And then that causes the string to vibrate. And the vibration of the string is a kind of backwards and forwards movement. And that movement is then propagated to the medium around it, to the air. And the air vibrating is not exactly the same as the string vibrating. The propagation of the movement has created a qualitatively different reality in a different medium. We then have the vibration of the ear drum, now twice removed from the original movement of the string. And then we have our sense of tone. And in each one of these jumps, we have a qualitatively new reality, a new type of movement, a new image, but we also have a continuity between the images. So what Birkstone kind of makes possible here is not only the propagation of a quality into new qualities by movements transforming into new mediums, but also an emergence of qualitative complexity as we find between the eardrum and the sense of pitch. All of these movements combined and converge to form the sense of tone that is experienced by a listener. And what we find is that images can indeed be greater than the sum of their parts. And this is especially true of the image that is most near and dear to all of us, the image that is central to everything we perceive. I'm talking about the body. The body, one's own body, is the central image from which all of our other experiences are funneled and translated and interpreted and made sense of. And in this case, the images interact as a whole. They form a unity and a totality that is greater than the sum of the parts. The body in this sense is not simply an object in space. It is not a Cartesian body, but instead a kind of sensory motor system. It's an entire matrix of movements and images and actions organized into something like a whole. This is an important aspect of Bergson's whole argument that images are not a kind of random flux of static moments and each one is just whole unto itself, a kind of data or information. Instead, our perception is a complex, ordered, organized system of movements and images. And this is made obvious by understanding what he calls motor schema. If we remember, remember from Kant, schema is a way in which the imagination takes our sensations and starts to form them into something coherent, something where the parts are related to each other, something greater than the sum of the parts. And but not quite an intellectual act which puts them in space and gives them a concept. So a schema is something which starts the organization, begins orchestrating movements and sensations, and it works habitually, so it works by enacting itself in trial and error and finding what works and then repeating what works. And our motor schema are what allow the coordination of our movements. And this coordination of the body is something like a unity, right? It's something like a whole in which the parts all converge and work together in a sort of unified direction and with a unified intentionality to them. And one's own body is the primary image that shapes and leads our interpretation of all other images. As we grow up, we learn to make sense of the world by moving around in it with our bodies. And the world that we experience is, an Im is the world of an embodied perceiver. It's the world of our bodies being within it. Now it's also within a family, within a community, within a society, and within a history. But those are ways in which our body learns to act and respond to its environment and other people. So images are dynamic, qualitatively rich, and organized into organismic-like unities. 
but they are always in a perpetual state of becoming as well. One's experience as a perceiving perspectival embodiment is being in a perpetual state of becoming in which one's own body is a sort of monadic organization of all of the images of the entire universe focused in on our body from moment to moment. And these images are connected and made sense of based on our body. Our body is like a prism or a sort of intricately carved jewel in which all of the images come into it but reflect within it based on its own needs and based on its own line of interpretation and its prior experiences. Here we need to consider Bergson's famous image of an inverted cone touching a plane. The plane represents the infinite plenum of images focused in on one point, and that point where the plane touches the cone is our body. It's our body as an indivisible process of becoming intimately woven into the fabric of all other images, but as the center point of those images. He's thinking something very similar to Leibniz here, that the point of the, our cone, this point that is the indivisible passage of becoming of our body, is interrelated with every other part of the universe and is a perspective on that whole. From our body's perspective on the whole, we get what Leibniz and Bergson refer to as a virtual image of the whole. So by virtue of touching a part of the universe, we touch the whole universe. In virtue of being in relation of images and movements with the universe, we are sensitive to everything that's happening within the universe. Now, not all of that becomes the actual perception that we have, the actual image, which is only part of the whole, only part of the universe. We can only perceive, you know, so much of the universe. But by virtue of touching that actual part, we virtually touch the whole. And Leibniz explains this, if you recall, through infinitely small perceptions. Now, everything that goes beyond what we're actually perceiving, what arises into conscious experience, everything else within the infinitude of the plenum of images is there in an infinitely small form as a kind of nascent perception or as a virtual image. And while the plane in his diagram is finite, it's a rectangle, I think we have reason to believe that this plane goes on to infinity, or at least that it's a plane with infinite richness. Now, from our perspective on the whole, as we get further and further away, those images become less and less relevant to our current reality um, that we're experiencing. And you can think deep space is less relevant than food and water and air right around us. And the body as this point of convergence of the whole plane of images and as a indivisible becoming is what Bergson calls a kaleidoscopic change. And here he's thinking of a kaleidoscope, which when you turn it, the image changes as a whole, right? Because it's made up of mirrors that reflect the same image in multiple quadrants. When you turn it, the whole images image changes, not simply one part of the image. And this is exactly the way our body perceives the world around us. The changes are whole and are organized. And you can think about this in terms of our repression of memories and sensations. This, this repression is not happening sort of additively and subtractively, like taking this out and adding this in, but is enriching and uh, shifting the focus as a whole and is modulating our attention, which is the whole psychological state, not simply parts within it. As we move around in the world, our attention changes the kaleidoscope. At certain points, certain things are more relevant and are more drawing of our attention within our perceptual field. And as we switch from one way of paying attention to our environment to another, we don't actually pay attention to that modulation itself. We don't pay attention, he says, to the shake of the kaleidoscope, only the new image that it presents to us. So our body keeps presenting us 
with a new orga organization, a new order of images, and we remain focused on the content, but don't investigate the change, the kaleidoscopic change itself, the activity essentially of consciousness integrating and uh, forming a whole out of our multiplicity of experiences. When we finally do try to understand this, when psychology and philosophy turn to investigate the shake of the kaleidoscope, the change of our perception as a whole, we tend to convey it in a cinematographical metaphor rather than understanding it kaleidoscopically. And the cinematographical is exactly this way of cutting up individual images, which in Matter and Memory, Bergson calls representations, and seeing our experience as the screen that a projector shoots onto. It keeps shooting an, an instantaneous static image that has no movement in it, but through this mechanism creates a false continuity. And each image changes in its configuration and its content but isn't in any way changing as a whole. It doesn't have any kind of kaleidoscopic change within it. Kaleidoscopic change is organic change, and this idea comes up in Creative Evolution where he expands this metaphor further. But as an organism evolves, it tends to evolve as a whole. And when we look at something like epigenesis and the development, developmental stages of mammals, for instance, or of certain animals like amphibians that go through different life stages and bugs as well, it's the whole that changes in these processes, not adding and subtracting parts, finite parts within the whole. And since we can approach the body in terms of dynamic images and see the body as the central image that is modulating and modifying all other images, we can see that the body is a sort of sui generis whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. And it's from this perspective that a certain indeterminacy within causality is able to enter into the process. When we treat reality as discrete quanta of causal power interrelated to each other in a strict mechanistic determined series, it's impossible to see how indeterminacy can ever enter into nature. But with this perspective of images as dynamic qualities, which form into organic wholes, we can start to see how indeterminacy can enter in without being unphilosophical or illogical or a, a sort of metaphysical assertion. An organic system of movements, images, is habituated. It is able to formulate certain organized movements, which it is able to use in certain situations, but not in other situations. And as life develops in its complexity and becomes habituated to more and more diverse ways of acting and reacting in diverse situations, the more life gains the opportunity to hesitate and delay its reactions. The more, you could say, the more reactions that you have stored up in habit, the more possible organizations of movement, the more diverse images that you harbor, the longer you are able to delay your action and allow more images and perceptions and memories to enter into play before we immediately react. There's an interval opened up between action and reaction, between perception and enactment. And this interval lets the image be gradually enriched by memories and by emotions. The longer we hesitate and delay, the more we can enrich our sense of the situation and the more indeterminacy enters the system. Consciousness emerges in this interval, in this hesitation. It is an integration of images that are immediately perceived and imagined and remembered. It's bringing together in this moment of hesitation, in this interval between action and reaction, the integration of more feelings, more emotions, more memories, and the enrichment of the images that are opening before us. Consciousness is what emerges when we are able to block out 
and remain focused on certain things. So consciousness always requires us to be leaving the majority of our present perceptions and the majority of our memories at bay, holding them back, holding them in check, but letting some through. It's by focusing on certain perceptions and by allowing certain memories to come in that consciousness and thinking emerge. And the same thing goes for memory. When we remember, we tend to allow one memory to come through at a time. And when we're thinking and kind of drawing on a variety of memories, we only let you know three or four memories through at a time in order to keep our thinking coherent. Consciousness is a double diminution, a double subtraction. It's subtracting from the complexity and co incoherence almost of sensations. Sensations can go in so many directions. We can look at the same painting, for example, and think many different thoughts and have many different feelings. And every sense experience holds more potential, an inexhaustible potential, honestly, than any thought will grasp of it. But in order to think about it, in order to make it conscious, we need to diminish its richness. And the same thing goes for memory. According to Bergson, we have completely failed to understand memory. And this is primarily because of common sense. Common sense is incapable, more or less, of understanding memory in its true form. Common sense tends to think that existence is measured by what we can be conscious of. What I mean is that existence and what we are conscious of are coextensive. If something exists, we can be conscious of it. And if we are conscious of something, it exists. This is the paradigm of common sense. Common sense works by bringing things into consciousness, having something present to consciousness, and analyzing it and contrasting it and associating it with other things that we bring present to consciousness. And here again, we're thinking very much of the notion of representation in German philosophy. For something to be true and to be real, it needs to be present to consciousness, it needs to be clear and distinct, and this tends to mean that it is instantaneously grasped in the present and that we tend to privilege the present as reality. We see this in a way in Augustine who says that the past and the future don't exist and also in Aristotle. Presence to consciousness is a model of conscious experience which reduces consciousness to static representations understood in a cinematographical manner as images flashing before our consciousness. It has no space to even think about or take seriously anything like the unconscious, unconscious perceptions, memory, or tendencies, inclinations. Whatever exists, exists as an object for consciousness. So in order to understand consciousness, we are gonna to have to completely get rid of that faulty idea of it. And there are a couple other really faulty ideas that we also need to get rid of. One is that memory is a brain state, is that memory is something that we store in the brain. Memories are contained in our brain or they are impressions that the brain preserves or saves somehow. And on the other hand, we also need to reject the idea that memory is a faculty or that it is the faculty of memory alone that is responsible for the preservation of memories. Bergson agrees with empiricism and intellectualism that remembering can make use of our habits of association, and these habits of association are somehow stored in the brain. But memory itself is not the association, nor the impression saved in the brain of the association. In both cases, memory would be presupposed before any association is ever made. And if it's merely some connection made in the brain, then there's no way of understanding why any connection should be any stronger or weaker than any other connection. In order to startly, totally start afresh on thinking about memory, Bergson first turns to involuntary memories in order to show that 
somehow memories are beyond our conscious control and beyond any kind of faculty which preserves them or grasps them like our sense organs. An involuntary memory is basically a really strong, vivid memory that comes to us without our having gone to look for it, without our having attempted consciously to retrieve it. It's a kind of memory that just strikes us like lightning or comes back to us in the taste of a food or in a smell. And it comes back not simply like a representation or a symbol or a vague kind of unintense, uh, non-vivid uh, sense of a time period or something like that. It's nothing of this weak sensation variety in the way that Hume would talk about it. Instead, it's a very embodied memory, a memory that strikes us to our core and that has what he would say almost an integral revival to it. It's not just bringing back a sketch of it. It's not a memory that we have of remembering that time, but the memory comes back in its complexity and in its detail and not filtered by our practical needs and not uh, represented to us by our intellect or imagination. It comes to us in its complexity and in its detail. And he gives another example to expand on this coming from near-death experiences. In a near-death experience, oftentimes there's past review, review of our life up to that moment. And in this experience, every detail of our memory unravels, things that we didn't remember remembering, things that we couldn't recall prior to this experience that come back to us with their full richness. Bergson is attempting to have us think that memories are not contained in the brain. They are not saved in some mechanism in the present, but that they continue to exist in and of themselves, even if they are not actual, even if they are not becoming in the present. They exist, but in a completely different manner than things that exist in the present in becoming. Bergson thinks that actually all of our memories with all of their details continue to exist. Every little tiny bit that we could never fully bring together in our recollection, in our recall. All of this inexhaustible manifold and an unschematizable, inexhaustible complexity of details of each moment. They continue to exist in and of themselves, even if they are not existing in the present. And even if we cannot make them all actual and all recall them all in their detail. This is what Bergson calls pure memory. Pure memory is like the stars in the night sky in a very dark sky without light pollution. There are just innumerable stars everywhere you look. And yet there are still kind of clusters and clumps where they're brighter and closer together. He calls these shining points and we can look to different areas of the night sky and see sort of different clusters, different nebulae. In the same way, our pure memory has all of these past moments. They're not laid out linearly in space on a number line, but instead they're kind of clouding and clumping in different areas. And we can look to one area here and one area here, and we can make connections from any point to any other point, but certain points are more densely clustered and certain areas are more distantly separated. And we need to make an attempt to experience or sense this reality of the past, the entire past, the integral past with every detail. We will begin by imagining it. We will attempt to reproduce in ourselves a sort of sublime order of magnitude of infinity, this infinite past with infinite details. And we'll form a sort of image or concept, and this will never suffice. We need to verify this reality for ourselves in a kind of memoir, in an inner reflection on our own vitality of our own consciousness. And by abiding in memory rather than in thought or in concept, while 
separating ourselves from action, which is this uh, limiting factor of our consciousness repressing. It is by abiding in memory and being in a more like a dream state than an active state, we loosen the tension of our consciousness and we make possible an experience of pure memory. And rather than again, forming a concept or a proof or anything like that, we will experience this reality and it will orient the way we think about consciousness and the way we think about reality itself. So the main way of getting at this is loosening the tension of consciousness. This is the number one hurdle to experiencing integral memory. Now, Bergson uses a really interesting set of metaphors here. He likens the tension of consciousness to the effort required to stand up. Standing up seems like a kind of rest, but when we think about it more deeply, there is a kind of tension going on there, kind of balancing needed to remain upright. And if you stand long enough, it's fatiguing, it's tiring. Well, the same thing goes for consciousness in what appears to be its state of rest, sort of open attentiveness. That too is a kind of composure. It's a kind of alertness. It's a kind of effort and attention to remain in a certain state. And so healthy consciousness, Bergson says, is a balancing of emotions and desires, which requires effort and tension in order to remain within. And we need things like play and art and music in order to give us relaxation from the tiring exertion of our effort in consciousness, in average everyday practical consciousness. The tension of consciousness holds back and keeps us on track, holds back distractions and keeps us on track by focusing on some but not all of what is real. And these actions, these uh, limitations, these filterings, these repressions limit what we know and limit us to more or less treating only what is actual and relevant as real. And reality exceeds both the actual and the relevant. And the opposite of these two things is the virtual and the integral. Consciousness is the attenuation of memory. It is a prolonging of the past into the present through a process of selection. Consciousness is almost a haunting of the present by the past. Life is accumulating and building strength by gathering its past, past together and bringing it into tension with the present. And we don't even have to have full-blown consciousness for all of this to come about. This is already the case with emotions. An emotion fixes our attention on something we are experiencing, maybe a perception or a memory or a feeling. And as we endure in this experience, our attention that emotion invests in this gradually makes what we're experiencing clearer and more vivid. And this, you know, sharpens the experience and intensifies it. And the feeling gradually evolves in a kind of feedback loop between the emotion and the object of the emotion. As we become more emotionally attached to the experience, the experience becomes richer and the image becomes more and more demanding on our attention. All of these moments of this gradual shift and gradual transformation converge and resonate in a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. This is the emergence of subjectivity, the gathering up of moments in time and focusing them in such that they can draw more out of themselves than they contain. Now, if we dilate completely out away from just an emotion to the whole of our psychological life, what Bergson will call the integral of experience or integral experience, we can also refer to this as integral personality, as he describes in an introduction to metaphysics. Our integral personality involves all of our memories, but involves them as virtual, 
as attempts to actualize themselves. And yet, because it's an infinite multiplicity of attempts, of tendencies and nascent movements, all of these uh, efforts pushing themselves into reality, they go in a multiplicity of different directions. Some part of us is pulled towards one way of being, another part to another way of being. You know, Bergson gave the example of being a mathematician. Part of him was a mathematician, and he became a philosopher instead. And so he allowed some of the tendencies to have predominance over other ones, but who Bergson is as a whole is not just the tendencies that he let come into actuality, that he followed into movements and allowed to become who he was. Also, some of the things that he didn't do are part of who he is. So our integral personality is infinitely rich to the point of incoherence and incompatibility of parts. And our integral personality is the nascent form of our memories. It's our memories attempting to actualize themselves in our consciousness. It's as if every memory wanted to be actualized and by clumping together with other memories that have some kind of agreement or harmony between them, they increase their force and a thousand uh, tiny pushes all of a sudden becomes a deluge. And here, Bergson is drawing on some ideas from Plotinus that souls are always yearning for bodies, but aren't actualized, aren't living, aren't conscious until a body rises up into which it can put itself in order to give life to that body. And this is how our memories are all the time attempting to incarnate themselves and through our conscious selection and through our habits we allow certain memories to take predominance over other ones and this guides our action and our self-expression and self-manifestation. Let's look at Bergson's image of a cone and see if we can put this all together now. The material world is a continuous flux of images and our body is the center of this flux represented as the indivisible point on the end of the cone. The top of the cone expands outward into an infinity of details of memory. Consciousness is strung between these two realities and is the tension holding between them where they mutually limit each other in order to create conscious experience. Between pure memory and matter, there are an unlimited number of planes of consciousness which represent ways that consciousness draws together its memories and in so doing, configures these memories in different ways in order to bring out different thoughts and representations and lines of reasoning. Each plane of consciousness is a way of making sense of things, and so we can be on a plane of consciousness while thinking a number of different thoughts relevant to that conscious plane. One plane will gather together everything related to driving, street signs, past memories, all of our motor habits, our motor schema related to it. Another will be our knowledge of a language like Latin and all of the words we've ever read in Latin. Each plane of consciousness is a contraction of the whole in a unique way. It forms a unique monadic perspective on the whole of our past. And there are a thousand ways that we can do this. The more details contracted in a plane of consciousness, the further it is removed from the plane of action. So the closer we get to matter, the more consciousness and the more our memories are immediately prepared to act and to 
work. But as we relax this tension and allow more and more memories to come in, more and more possibilities are there and the lack of funneling and uh, focusing means that they have a lot less claim to being actualized over any other memory. And since all of our memories have this kind of beyond coherent uh, divergence to them, qualitative multiplicity, heterogeneity, the more memories that come in, the less movement oriented, the less action oriented it is. And this is why Bergson likens it to dreams. So the infinite is at play here in a few different ways. We can already see that matter being conceived of as dynamic images are infinitely rich and infinitely detailed. So even if we don't think of infinite expanse in every direction and infinite spatial extension, we at least have to think of infinitely detailed qualitative heterogeneity within images and within bodies and movements. And then within consciousness, there are also an infinite number of planes of possible ways of putting together memory. And we also find in consciousness indeterminacy, indetermination. This comes through hesitation, right? The intensification of life into a hesitating which allows an interval of memory to enter into our experience. Indeterminacy is where the infinite comes into the causal process and opens it to novelty and creative emergence. And finally, memory presents us with the most profound and sublime form of infinite, an infinity of nuances and details of each moment of our past. And it shows us an integral, what we might call virtual whole, enveloping an infinity of nuances and details, and which is not reducible to consciousness, and which consciousness, by the sheer fact that it brings things into presence, cannot fully appreciate memory in itself, pure memory, which is unconscious. Both matter and memory go beyond consciousness in being inexhaustible in their detail and in their qualitative nuance. Habit and emotions introduce a very small degree of tension, while imagination and invention pull in more and more details of our past. There are various tenors of consciousness, you might say, various frequencies and levels of resonance, more expanded and more constricted ways of thinking. Representational logic is a more constricted form of thought, while poetry and phenomenology are more expanded and relaxed, open to a greater infinity of nuances. <laughs> <laughs>